such a conflict? I mean, a conflict. I mean, it's possible. Look, I, I think the ambassador made solid points, which is Iran has shown a willingness and a capability to attack Israel. We know they're very close to a nuclear weapon. And I remember all my time in Congress being promised by every administration that if Iran actually does get very close to a nuclear weapon, that will be prevented. Iran will never have a nuclear weapon. Well, well yeah. we're at that moment now. So while I'm not sitting here saying that maybe the right response oh. on this is to attack the nuclear program, the question is, we are on the edge oh, of that Oh, we're so fucking we stupid, dude. Country, we are so fucking dumb, dude. We will either dumb, have dude. a nuclear armed Iran, or we won't, and we may have to do something about that. Us and Israel, probably largely on Israel. So is it the best response on this attack? I don't know. I'll leave that up to the Israelis. But I can tell you what certainly needs to happen, I think, is going after Iran's, but this is a very directly proportionate response, is going after Iran's ability to make the exact drones they sent against Israel and that they're supplying. This is a side benefit that they're supplying to Russia yeah. to attack Ukraine with. All right, stand by for a moment, uh, Adam. Uh, Jeremy Diamond, our correspondent, uh, is in northern Israel right now, and there's some uh, very intense developments unfolding where you are, Jeremy. Tell our viewers. Yeah, that's right, Wolf. We are in northern Israel, and in just the past hour, uh, there were 25 projectiles that were fired from Lebanon towards the Golan Heights. Uh, my team and I, as we arrived here, we actually were able to hear what sounded like multiple interceptions of those projectiles. The Israeli military is not specifying whether those were drones or, uh, or, or missiles in this case, um, but we do understand that these were fired from Lebanon. Earlier this evening, of course, uh, this area in northern Israel uh, did get projectiles, uh, again, unclear if drones or missiles that were fired from Iran as part of that large-scale attack that Iran carried out on northern Israel as well as in southern Israel. Uh, we also understand that uh, Hezbollah uh, claimed responsibility for firing multiple missiles, uh, multiple rockets earlier uh, this evening uh, in the direction of the Golan Heights as well. And so this is what's critical about this part of northern Israel, is that this is really the intersection both of this proxy battle that Iran and Israel have been fighting for months now as Hezbollah and Israel uh, have been trading fire across the Israeli-Lebanese border uh, for months now since the beginning uh, of, uh, of this war, uh, but also now uh, the site of uh, Iran's uh, latest uh, response and Iran's uh, first attack uh, against uh, Israeli soil. Now, we do not uh, have any reports of any of those drones or missiles that were fired by Iran actually hitting targets here in northern Israel. No reports of any hits on the ground. Uh, it appears uh, that uh, the majority of those projectiles were intercepted either uh, here uh, in Israeli airspace. We do have video of some of those intercepts happening over the Golan Heights, uh, but also uh, across the border in, in Syria. There were also multiple interceptions that were reported there as well. Wolf. And those interceptions, I think, were largely done by the United States uh, air defense system that's been working together with the Israelis to prevent these Iranian drones and these rockets and missiles, cruise missiles and others from coming into Israel. The U.S. is deeply involved in that. Uh, Jim Shudo has a follow-up question for you, Jeremy. Go ahead, Jim. Jeremy, I, I wonder, because that cross-border fire, both from the Lebanese side of the border, the Syria side of the border, has, has been going on for some time, going back to October 7th, in fact, predating October 7th. Is the pace tonight at all increasing? It, it, because, of course, the question has been, would Hezbollah get involved in any significant way, open up a northern front in this war, or is this more in line with what we've seen in recent weeks and months? Yeah, you know, Jim, it's a great question, and it is really hard to tell at this point. I mean, you know, Hezbollah and Iran certainly do uh, uh, speak. They do coordinate their military uh, activities. Hezbollah is uh, one of Iran's most significant proxies uh, in this region. Uh, but whether or not the barrage of rockets that we saw from Hezbollah earlier was coordinated with uh, this uh, Iranian uh, attack on Israel uh, is, is hard to tell. And actually, I'm seeing what, what looked like uh, some interceptions in in the other direction here 
not hearing any sirens or the sounds of that but i did just see some flashes in the air and and, Bro, and i would fucking just know that this area i mean they are used to having these uh big homies about to get fucking there. lasered by a hezbollah barrages, drone over here coming, uh, from uh, lebanon He's like i don't hear any fucking sirens i'm sure it's and they fine also are used to the sound of of jets and and as uh i can hear here jets just continuously flying overhead and yep i just heard the booms from what i thought were were potential interceptions and so the the delay there I don't know if you can hear that on my microphone, but but those definitely sound like interceptions. The light obviously travels faster than sound, so you can see those first. And now I'm hearing that's the third uh, boom that we just heard. It must be at some distance, so there is a possibility that that could actually be intercepted in Syria rather than in the Golan Heights. Um, we I'm just checking my phone to see, yep, there were some siren alerts in northern Israel. Um, in the in the Golan Heights, indeed, um, not far from our, not too far from our position, actually, maybe a distance of 10 kilometers or so. So what, what's also interesting is that the home front command here in Israel, actually, before this latest barrage that we had over the past hour, they had actually told residents in both northern Israel as well as southern Israel who had earlier been instructed to stay near shelters that they could return to normal, indicating that that large scale attack from Iran that the threat, for now at least, was over. And yet, what we are seeing instead is more rockets being fired from Lebanon, likely uh, by Hezbollah, uh, indicating that this is going to continue on as it has uh, for months now, as you were just mentioning, Jim. So, uh, it's, it's Wolf again, uh, Jeremy. I just want to be precise right now. So, in addition to Iran launching all these drones and rockets and missiles towards Israel, it now looks like their proxy in southern Lebanon, Hezbollah, is beginning to do the same thing. You say at least 25 projectiles have been fired from Lebanon by Hezbollah, not the Lebanese military or the Lebanese government, Hezbollah forces, this Iranian proxy in southern Lebanon towards Israel. Uh, so it looks like they're getting involved directly in this Iran attack against Israel. But is, is that what I understand? Yeah, and, and this was... Yeah, and this was not the only barrage that we saw coming from Lebanon uh, tonight. Earlier in the day, Hezbollah said that it had fired uh, multiple uh, rockets in the direction of uh, an Israeli military base in the Golan Heights, where it has directed rockets in the past as well. Uh, again, the question Hezbollah. that Jim raised is, is a good Hezbollah. one in terms of how much is this part of that Iranian response? How much of this is part of what we have seen over the course of months now, which is Hezbollah firing rockets into the Golan Heights, into northern Israel? Uh, that mu that part is, is what's tricky to to distinguish here. Uh, you know, there's no indication that you know even as Iran may may suggest may have indicated earlier tonight that this was its response to those strikes in Syria that the response was over as far as it was concerned. There's no indication that that means that Hezbollah is going to stop firing rockets into northern Israel, nor does it mean that Israel is going to stop conducting airstrikes into southern Lebanon, which we have also seen at a similar clip over the course of the last six months. All right, Jeremy, just be careful over there. We'll stay in very close touch with you. Jeremy Diamond is in northern Israel. It looks like Hezbollah is beginning to launch a lot of rockets and missiles towards Israel from southern Lebanon. We'll watch that unfold. Uh, this is I still can't get over how Bibi denied Ukraine the Iron Dome. Why? I understand he hates Muslims, but why deny Ukraine aid to defend them against Iran's ally? It makes no sense. What the fuck? Chatter about to find out some very fun new things about uh, who Israel is also a lot.
feet, which keeps you in the loop with new content. As an example, they've uh, this month shipped upgraded weekly streaks as a feature. There are community boss battles, so that's also the cool. Fuck? Um, yeah, there you'll see all the comings and goings of the platform. It's just a really awesome package, and you can check them out today at boot.dev forward slash Bowser, where code Bowser gets you 25% off your first purchase, and that's backed by a no questions asked 30 day money back guarantee. And we've got free demos of all of their courses. That's so, pretty good. Book, and let's roll. First, we've got a graph of subscribers. Okay. This is something we've not got in a decade. Blizzard stopped reporting mm -hmm. them during Warlords of Draenor because, yeah. yeah, the sub numbers went down pretty damn big. They were bad. Anyway, you see the numbers be pretty good for the launch of Legion. Mm -hmm. We see Legion lose players, then flatten out. BFA bumps us up, but not by as much as I thought, to be honest. But immediately yeah. after bfa we do see awful awful months and what we're actually looking at here is a rolling average of world of warcraft subscribers it does not get any more real than that now at the time of classics launch we heard that it just about doubled wow subs and this graph absolutely does back that up classic then was not a surprise a lot of people probably were playing classic back then i mean classic was like it was probably one of the biggest game releases ever it was insane. Helping as we were moving into Shadowlands, of course, given the pandemic, yeah. it just did incredibly well. But that was followed by crippling failure. Mm -hmm. And when we zoom in, we see the unbroken line is the actual subs. The dash line is the expected subs. You can see Shadowlands dropped like a rock. And unlike yeah. Legion and BFA, Classic existed during those initial quarters of Shadowlands. It did. And looking at this, you may think the TBC and Wrath Classic didn't help much. Remember, TBC, Wrath Classic, and regular World of Warcraft all show the same subscription. So even if TBC was doing pretty decently, that could very much be cancelled out by the performance of Sh I think that's what it was. Because TBC, like, I, I do think that, like, classic, classic, like, vanilla WoW, 2004 WoW, that's what is going to be the most popular. Now, a lot of people seem to still be rating in Wrath, and, like, actually, that might not be true. But, like, to me, I thought classic was, like, really the big one. And also, I would argue that with Wrath and, and, uh, and Burning Crusade, this number would have been even lower if it didn't have this. I, I think that if anything, the Shadowlands numbers would have gone down into the fucking dirt. Because you've got to remember, like, that was also at the exact same time as, like, that whole sexual harassment lawsuit and everything like that. Because Burning Crusade came out on, like, what, June 2nd or something like that, 2021? So that was, like, two months afterwards. It was only, like, this much down? I don't know, man. TBC phase two, pay to win, killed it. Yeah, it definitely hurt a lot. The boycott? Yeah, true. Applies to BFA too. Well, BFA was pretty far back in the, in, the, in the past. Like that wasn't really the same thing. But like, I would say that the Shadowlands like content drought was a thousand times worse than BFA. Because like, at least with BFA, people still had hope for classic. With Shadowlands, it was already over. Shadowlands. And of course, it's very much not a surprise when we see this labeled as... And also, as I said, the beginning of Shadowlands was a great game. The problem was really that they didn't innovate and make the game, uh, you know, they didn't change the game fast enough. I really had a lot of fun playing Shadowlands the first couple months. It was great. High churn. Yeah, we all knew that. Mm -hmm. The difference here is we're hearing it from Blizzard directly. Now, next, here's another slide for us to look at, and this one gets really interesting. This is a breakdown of why Shadowlands mm -hmm. didn't work in their estimation. They say afterlife setting wasn't accessible, new antagonist wasn't developed. An afterlife setting wasn't accessible. Um... I think the reason why it wasn't accessible is they didn't try to have enough, like they tried to invent their whole own mythology for it. And I think that if they had made it more in line with like kind of existing mythology, I think people would have at least been able to understand it better. Well known story heroes were diminished. I mean, does that yeah. match of Shadowlands felt to you? Certainly does for me. And this from yeah. the horse's mouth is the closest that we will see to Blizzard just saying straight up, this whole thing was a mistake. We shouldn't have done it. We ruined our iconic heroes. The villain sucked. As for Yeah, it even says well-known story heroes were diminished. I mean, they're probably talking about like Arthas, etc. Maybe not hero in that case, but you know what I mean. Uh, I think this is definitely true. I mean, Shadowlands, uh, new antagonist wasn't developed. That, that's really the problem. Like, I think the Jailer could have been a fantastic, like, antagonist, a fantastic boss. But it just wasn't, it just wasn't developed.
That's all there was to it. Yeah, who cares? As for gameplay, they say it lacked variety, borrowed power was wearing yeah. thin, systems were not evolving, and that I get. They were just iterating. Very fucking true. Absolutely. They are totally on the money with this. Reading the same thing again and again and again. Yep. And when we think about variety, I mean, hey, 16 months in the sanguine depths, does that sound good to you? Ugh. Vitally, they call out community specifically saying gaps in content, yeah. lack of transparency, didn't feel hurt. I mean, totally fucking accurate. Absolutely. It's great to see Blizzard just, yep, there it is. I mean, it's all shit that we said, right? But Flipped this an after is cooler than Jailer. Everybody did. A lot of Team 2 members were not happy at this period of time. There's a phrase I could yeah. say referring to some cliques, but I will not say it because it would be revealing and that would be irresponsible. But that kind of thing was going on. Of course. And the other side is there has Well, this was also what the... Ex Shadowlands, like, this was in the middle of that sexual harassment lawsuit in California. It was huge. So, yeah, Absolutely. There's been quite a lot of staff turnover since the Shadowlands. Anyway, TLDR, mm -hmm. it was a little bit of a shit show, and I think that absolutely did show in their public communications. The question yeah. then for us is, does Which the makes content sense. of this slideshow feel like it's been internalized by the team? I mean, literally, in some ways. game -wise, I think that, yes, they have internalized these things, and I think Dragonflight fixed a lot of the problems that were in Shadowlands. Dragonflight has some of the same problems, like I was saying, like add-ons, like raids, stuff like that.